viewers good day to all of you this is dr bk for you and today i am going to discuss about the liver so now directly going to the brief introduction about the liver we all know that liver is actually the largest gland in our body and it performs so many functions so n number of functions so that is why it is aptly termed as the liver and it is also called as the hepar in greek so that is the term that is why we call it as hepatic hepatic flexure of colon hepatic segments hepatic artery hepatic vein and all those things now basically the liver is an exocrine and it also performs some endocrine function also so it performs n number of functions which i will try to enumerate a few of them now since it is the largest gland in the human body it weighs around 1.5 kilograms in an healthy adult human b that is the approximate weight of the liver and comprises of around 2.5% of the total body weight so it is actually 140th of our body weight so it occupies our right side of the abdomen right upper part so that is the right hypochondrium epigastric and also extends to some amount on to the left side also crosses the midline and also extends to the left side so as i told you it has got both exocrine and endocrine functions so main thing you know it actually secretes bile for the emulsification of the fat then so many metabolic activities it stores glucose in the form of glycogen that is one of the metabolism it is involved so stores glycogen and secretes by as i told you through the biliary ductal passages is also disseminates the amino acids in the urea cycle then it is responsible for production of plasma proteins your serum proteins except the immunoglobulins then it is responsible for the conversion of tetra iodo thyroidine into tri iodo thyroidine then it destroys worn out rbcs then it also detoxifies alcohol drugs and whatever the toxic substances is actually detoxed by the liver and only then it enters into the circulation which is absorbed from the gut that is one of the functions and then in fetal life it is also hemopoietic it is responsible for the production of rbcs okay so then it is also responsible for part of cholesterol production so steroid hormones the cholesterol mainly the steroid hormones requirement that is also produced by the liver okay and of course because of its hemopoietic function in fetus the liver also is large in the fetus and in the newborn it also stores excess triglycerides in the form of lipid droplets <coughs> so due to this all these metabolic activities it dissipates much heat so naturally it is also contributing for maintaining the homeostasis of our body that is temperature regulation so maintain a optimum and a, what do you call it as a optimum as well as a standard uniform temperature okay so with the short 
introduction i will directly pass on to the anatomical features of the liver where the liver actually it is situated i told you it is situated in the right hypochondrium mainly it is situated in the right hypochondrium then extends into the epigastrium and also to the left hypochondrial region up to the mid clavicular line up to the mid clavicular line it extends sometimes the liver also extends into the right lumbar region it also extends into the right lumbar region so the uppermost end goes up to the fifth intercostal space so where the heart is present and only thing which is separating the liver and the heart above is the diaphragm so up to the fifth intercostal space it can extend the inferior border actually if you look at the sharp inferior border crosses the midline and then it also cuts the trans pyloric plane cuts the trans pyloric plane so here you are able to see it is cutting the trans pyloric plane the inferior border at the junction of the right lateral plane and the trans pyloric plane where the fundus of gall bladder is also present so mainly occupies the right hypochondrium upper part of epigastrium and also your left hypochondrium it also extends into the right lumbar region so that is the disposition of the liver in the abdominal cavity now shape it is wedge shape or you can tell roughly it is pyramidal shape so this is wedge shape with the apex lying to one side okay with apex lying to one side and the base of the wedge the base of the wedge is actually directed towards the or it is facing base actually directed towards the uh mainly towards the left side and the apex is actually towards the right side apex is directed towards the right side okay it's like a pyramid laid on to one side so weight as i told you it is approximately 1.5 kg and slightly lower in case of females in infants or newborn it is 118 of the body weight whereas in adults it is 140 of the body weight that is because in infants it is also taking part in the hemopoiesis or production of rbcs it is reddish brown in color so that is the color of the liver so you hold the liver in the anatomical position in such a way so that is the base of the edge which is directed downwards and this is the upper point of the apex of the wedge which is above and to the right side posteriorly you see the inferior vena cava in a groove the vena cava is not present at least the groove for inferior vena cava should be present at the back side posteriorly so that is the normal anatomical position of the liver now coming to the borders and surfaces of the liver there are five surfaces but actually you can also call them as or broadly classified into two surfaces one is the inferior or the visceral surface which is related to so many other surrounding abdominal organs and the remaining four surfaces are molded to the shape of the diaphragm so apart from the visceral surface the other surfaces can be called as simply as one the diaphragmatic surface but for the sake of description and understanding this diaphragmatic surface is again divided into anterior surface superior surface right lateral surface and posterior surface okay 
So the diaphragmatic surface is again divided into anterior, superior, posterior, and right lateral surface. Then the we have the remaining one surface that is the visceral surface. The lobes are actually right and left lobe of the liver. Whereas the demarcation between the right and left lobe anatomically it is different and physiologically it is different. Anatomical and physiological right and left lobes. Mainly you have the right and left lobe of the liver. Then you have accessory quadrate lobe and the caudate lobe. You have quadrate lobe and caudate lobe. Sometimes occasionally, occasionally you find one more lobe which is actually called as the Riedel's lobe. The Riedel's lobe is an accessory lobe which you can see from the right lateral surface extending downwards. That is actually called as the Riedel's lobe, not always present. So mainly diaphragmatic surface divided into four, anterior, superior, posterior and right lateral surface. Then you have the inferior or the visceral surface. Three borders, sharp border which is the inferior border, the other borders are ill defined where you have the superior border, okay. Then you have the posterior superior and posterior inferior borders. Inferior, you have the posterior superior and posterior inferior borders. So this is the inferior border which is a very sharp border. Apart from that, you see the posterior superior and posterior inferior borders. There is no clear demarcation between the anterior surface, superior and the right lateral surface. So, all are actually continuous with each other. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we will see the surfaces one by one. So, first uh, on the diaphragmatic surface, what you see is the superior surface. The superior surface is molded to the dome of the diaphragm and it is peritoneal in nature. The peritoneum from the under surface of the diaphragm reflects on top as the superior layer of coronary ligament on the right side an anterior layer of coronary ligament on the left side. Small non-peritoneal area you see where the divergence of the falciform ligament. The falciform ligament diverges and that area is small non-peritoneal area. Now, the superior surface you see a depressed area that is actually the for the cardiac impression. So, above the diaphragm you have the, actually this part is related to the central tendon of the diaphragm. Above that you have the heart which is covered by the pericardium, superior surface. Okay, it is actually covered by the pericardium. So, you have cardiac area. On either side it is related to the lower border of the lung and the pleura. So, mostly the diaphragmatic surface of the lung diaphragmatic surface of right lung and diaphragmatic surface of left lung covered by the diaphragmatic pleura is actually related to the superior surface and depressed in the center because of the presence of the heart. Let you look at the, so that is the heart which is present along the superior surface in the middle above the diaphragm and here you have the diaphragmatic surface of lung. Posterior surface it is limited above by the posterior superior border, which is formed by the superior layer of coronary ligament, and here the inferior layer of coronary ligament. Mainly, the features you see in the posterior surface is a rough bare area of the liver. This part is actually not covered by the peritoneum. The posterior surface mainly have a depression for the vertebral column, and lateral to that, this surface is actually lodged in the paravertebral gutter. It is actually lodged in the paravertebral gutter and it is also related to the diaphragm. The boundaries of bare area are to the left you have the groove for IVC, above you have the superior layer of 
coronary ligament. Below you have the inferior layer of coronary ligament and apex of the bad area is actually formed by the right triangular ligament. So here branches of the portal radicals veins anastomose with the diaphragmatic veins. So the bare area is actually a site of porto cable or also called as porto systemic anastomosis. So you see the bare area, then we have the groove for the inferior vena cava again which is not covered by the peritoneum, which is actually not covered by the peritoneum. Then we have the fissure for the ligamentum venosum. Fissure for ligamentum venosum. The fissure for ligamentum venosum has got again an anterior lip, posterior lip, and a floor. Floor is again non peritoneal, which consists of the ductus venosus. So, ductus venosus is a channel which actually communicates with the left branch of portal vein. Communicates the left branch of portal vein with the left umbilical vein. So, it is a shunt formed in the fetal life which is replaced by the ligamentum venosum. The duct is replaced by a ligament. Only in fetal life it is active. So, that is called as the ductus venosus which is ligamentum venosum which is covered by the fissure for ligamentum venosum again covered the lips are covered by the peritoneum. Anterior wall and anterior lip is actually by the, the peritoneum of the greater sac and posterior wall and posterior lip is by the peritoneum of the lesser sac. Then more laterally you come here on the posterior surface. Of course, you see the left triangular ligament here, the left uh, division of the falciform ligament reflecting on to the from the diaphragm as the left triangular ligament. Then you have the impression for the esophagus. The terminal part of the esophagus makes an impression on the posterior surface. Okay. So that is about the posterior surface, bare area, group for inferior vena cava. Followed by that, you will be able to see the fissure for ligamentum venosum. In between the fissure for ligamentum venosum and the IVC, you also see the quadrate, sorry, caudate lobe. The caudate lobe on either side, bounded to the right side by the groove for IVC, groove for ligamentum venosum. And here, you see the posterior superior part of the border of the liver. And anteriorly and below, you see the porta hepatis, that is the caudate lobe of the liver. That part also you can see the posterior surface. Then what you are able to see here is the anterior surface. The anterior surface, it is actually related to the right costal margin. So the right part is actually related to the right costal margin. And the left part is actually related to the left costal margin, so the ribs and separated by the diaphragm. In center, it is related to the xiphoid process and the anterior abdominal wall, a small area. In between the right and left costal margin, it is actually related to the xiphoid process and the anterior abdominal wall. So that is what we have seen in the last one, it is divided by the falciform ligament into right and left, the anterior surface. This we have seen here by the falciform ligament. So related to the anterior abdominal wall, the small area in between the two costal margin areas. Then we have the right lateral surface. This surface is related to 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th and 11th ribs, 7 to 11 ribs. In between the ribs or the costal uh, intercostal spaces with muscles, all those things. Between that and the light lateral surface, what intervenes again is your diaphragm. This right lateral surface can be due to upper one third, middle one third and lower one third. Upper one third is related to the lower border of the right lung. 
and right costodiaphragmatic recess right lung and right costodiaphragmatic recess up to the 8th rib up to the 10th rib only the costodiaphragmatic recess and below that it is related only to the diaphragm so any liver biopsies can be approached on the right lateral surface below the 9th costal <coughs> below the ninth intercostal space after full expiration okay so that you don't puncture the pleura for liver biopsy that is about the right lateral surface now coming to the visceral or the inferior surface what are all the features you come across on the visceral or the inferior surface it is irregular and you can see a lot of impressions for the surrounding viscera so that is why it is actually called as the visceral surface so it is directed downwards backwards and towards the lift the base of the wedge actually it is and it is separated from the anterior surface by the sharp inferior border and also the round border from the right lateral surface the inferior border also separates the visceral surface from the right lateral surface it is separated from the posterior surface by the posterior inferior border okay that is you are able to see the extent of the visceral surface so it is mainly covered by the peritoneum except porta hepatis not covered by peritoneum fossa for gall bladder is again not non peritoneal area then even the depth of the ligamentum teres it is not covered by peritoneum not only that if you look at the visceral surface and for that matter the whole of the liver it is covered by the peritoneum of the lesser sac greater sac except the caudate lobe with the caudate process is actually covered with the lesser sac only the caudate lobe and the caudate process of the liver is covered by peritoneum of the lesser sac the remaining part of the liver is covered by the peritoneum of the greater sac of course excluding the non peritoneal areas such as your bare area fossa for gall bladder fissure for ivc ligamentum venous now the impressions which is seen on the inferior surface mainly from left to right you see the gastric impression which is made by the fundus of the stomach most left you see the gastric impression then from there you see another projection like thing which is called as the tuber omentale so this tuber omentale is actually facing the tuber omentale of the pancreas then you have the fissure for ligamentum teres so the ligamentum teres is again obliterated left umbilical vein okay fissure for ligamentum teres quadrate lobe which is bounded on to the right side by the fissure for ligamentum teres then on to the left side by the fossa for gall bladder below by the inferior border of liver and above by the porta hepatis then of course between the caudate lobe behind and quadrate lobe in the front what you see here is the porta hepatis it is considered as the gateway for structures entering and leaving the liver but it is not a true gateway then of course part of caudate lobe you have seen the posterior surface on the inferior surface you see caudate process you mainly see the caudate process which is directed somewhat towards the left side the caudate process and then what you see here is the papillary process one more process of the caudate lobe which is directed downwards and to the right is the papillary process so the caudate process and caudate lobe mainly forms the roof of the epiploic foramen the epiploic from above formed by the caudate process below formed by the first part of duodenum behind by the this structure inferior vena cava and in front by the right free margin of lesser omentum 
the right free margin of lesser momentum then more laterally you come you have the duodenal impression <coughs> first part of the duodenum makes an impression then you have the colic impression right colic flexure and then the anterior surface of the right kidney that is the renal impression so gastric impression duodenal impression colic impression renal impression sometimes more posteriorly and above you go you also see the suprarenal impression so that is the impressions of the visceral surface or the inferior surface of the liver so you can see a fair idea of about how these structures are disposed so cardiac uh, sorry uh, the gastric impression made by the fundus of the stomach duodenal impression you are able to see here then the kidney border that makes an impression then the colic impression they are all related to the inferior surface or the visceral surface of the liver now the inferior border of the liver is one of the sharp border and separates your diaphragmatic to be more precise the anterior surface from the visceral surface then it is round laterally where it separates the visceral surface from the right lateral surface okay sharp in the front and it is round laterally where it separates the visceral surface from the right lateral surface <coughs> two notches you can see what is the notch for the ligamentum teres and other one is the cystic notch for the gall bladder okay so that is actually the ligamentum teres or interlobar notch because the anatomical lobes are divided based on the attachment of the falciform ligament and then the cystic notch you are able to see here so where the fundus of gallbladder projects from the inferior or beyond the inferior border of the liver now broadly dividing the liver into lobes we have the right lobe and the left lobe so the right and left lobe are mainly divided by or on the basis of attachment of the falciform ligament attachment of the falciform where right lobe is actually very large mainly forms the 5/6 okay or 6 times larger than the left lobe now on the visceral surface if you look at this demarcation of the lobes so it extends from the fissure for ligamentum venosum to the fissure for ligamentum teres below you can see fissure for ligamentum venosum to the fissure for ligamentum teres the quadrate lobe is actually you are able to see the quadrate lobe on the visceral surface and the boundaries i have already told you teres porta hepatis fossa for gall bladder okay so it is functionally related to the left lobe of the liver quadrate lobe now the caudate lobe which you see on the upper surface of the visceral surface of the liver is bounded by the fissure for ligamentum venosum groove for ivc and in the front by the porta hepatis this is equally distributed to the right and left lobe okay so what is porta hepatis so here you are able to see the porta hepatis it is a transverse fissure which you are able to see here and it has a two lips which is actually by the anterior and posterior layer of the lesser omentum it extends from the neck of the gall bladder to the fissure for ligamentum venosum posteriorly and ligamentum teres anterior that is the extension we have both layers of the lesser omentum and along the right free margin both the layers are continuous the both the layers of lesser omentum are continuous around the porta hepatis along the right free margin structures enter and leave the liver mainly the right and left hepatic ducts 
leave it or emerge out right and left branch of hepatic artery right and left branch of portal vein okay all actually enter then you have hepatic plexus of veins then the lymphatics but even though this is not considered as the true gateway of the liver because the true gateway is the fossa or the groove for the ivc where the hepatic veins open into the inferior vena cava okay so structures arranged in the porta hepatis again we have discussed well and enough in so many classes so to the right side you have the bile duct to the left side you have the hepatic artery in between and behind you have the portal vein so these are the structures which i have already mentioned branches of hepatic artery portal vein bile duct nerves lymphatics and it is not a true hilum or gateway of the liver so anatomical lobes is mainly by the attachment of the falciform ligaments which does not again divide the liver into two equal lobes right lobe or the and the left lobe physiological lobes is somewhat not corresponding to the division of the anatomical lobes and that is mainly the classification is based on the distribution of the right and left branch of the hepatic artery right and left branch of the portal vein and the right and left hepatic ducts so right lobe of the liver will be supplied by right branch of hepatic artery drained by not drained by actually right branch of portal vein and that what happens is you have the right hepatic duct emerging and this is the same for the left lobe also so that is why they are called as the functional or true lobes of the liver you look at if you look at the on the posterior inferior surface it passes from the fossa for gall bladder to the groove for ivs and here also you can see the same thing posterior inferior surface it passes from the groove for ivc to the fossa for gall bladder so as i told you the quadrate lobe is equally shared between the right and left lobes on the anterior superior surface it passes from cystic notch to the ivc so somewhat to the right of falciform ligament and of course they are equal in size the physiological right and left lobes <coughs> so on the anterior surface <coughs> from the cystic notch on the inferior border to the inferior vena cava here again groove for ivc to the fossa for gall bladder so the quadrate lobe is equally shared between the right and the left lobe what are hepatic segments there are totally eight segments eight hepatic segments so right side first they are basically divided into anterior and posterior left side they are divided into medial and lateral so two on the right side two on the left side anterior and posterior medial and lateral now this each of this again anterior and posterior or medial and lateral is again divided into superior inferior superior inferior so thereby you get eight segments okay so each of this further divided into upper and lower parts so surgically resectable segment so any part segmental lobectomy of the liver can be performed so they are drained by the respective bile duct portal vein and hepatic artery so basically if you see the hepatic veins they are intersegmental mostly the veins are actually intersegmental they run in between the segments and thereby they comprise us of finally three groups superior middle and inferior okay even in the lung you can see bronchopulmonary segments the pulmonary veins they are actually intersegmental in distribution to so more than one segment they actually drain so one more person who also gave segmental distribution of the liver is actually the coenads segment 
so he has given segmental numbers first segment second segment third fourth five six seven and eight so for undergraduate level i feel that uh, it is too much now to go into the details of this so that is about these hepatic segments totally eight segments right side four left side four medial lateral for the left side anterior posterior for the right side and each of this e four segments is again divided into upper and lower <coughs> coming to the peritoneal relations as i told you it's a intra peritoneal organ and it is covered by the peritoneum so the non peritoneal areas bad area is one single large bad area which we have discussed the other short bad areas of liver are groove for ivc fossa for gall bladder groove for ligamentum venosum so these are the other bad areas of liver and if you want more precisely even the porta hepatis is a bad area of liver only the lips are actually covered by the anterior and posterior layer of the lesser omentum so the porta hepatis so the large bad area groove for ligamentum venosum fossa for gall bladder then you have the porta hepatis so these are all the other bad areas of the liver apart from the principal large bad area the principal bad area is again a site of porto systemic anastomosis so the ligaments related to liver are mainly falciform ligament you are able to see from the umbilicus it goes to the diaphragm and then splits into right and left half joins with the peritoneum of the reflecting from above the diaphragm and into right triangular ligament joining with the superior layer of coronary ligament here anterior layer of left triangular ligament so the two triangular ligaments we have seen superior and inferior layer of coronary ligament joined to form the right triangular ligament then you have the lesser omentum which is attached uh, to the margins of the porta hepatis it has got hepato duodenal part and hepato gastric part one which is extending from the liver to the lesser curvature of the stomach and one which is extending up to the first uh, 2.5 cm of the first part of the duodenum true ligaments obliterated left umbilical vein is the ligamentum teres ductus venosus forms the ligamentum venosum so that is the ligamentum teres which is seen in the posterior most end of the falciform ligament round ligament teres means rounded and that is the reflection of the peritoneum from the diaphragm forming the right and left triangular ligaments and that is the ligamentum venosum which is formed by the ductus venosus coming to the blood supply of the liver mainly hepatic artery supplies around 15% or 20 15 to 25% is mainly by the hepatic artery the remaining 75 to 85% is mainly supplied by the portal vein so portal circulation so all which is absorbed blood vessels from the intestine your gat gastrointestinal tract takes part in the formation of portal vein and then it divides into right and left branch which is distributed to the right and left physiological lobes of the liver so they break down into sinusoids of the liver pass as hepatic sinusoids and each hepatic lobule what happens is into the central vein they pour okay then from there what happens is it drains mainly into right left and middle veins okay so the left hepatic vein is actually present between the lateral segments medial and lateral part of the left lobe between the right lobe and the left lobe you have the middle group of veins and then you have the left hepatic vein between the anterior and posterior segments of the two lobes it is nothing simple intersegmental in nature between the two segments of the left lobe you have the left hepatic vein between the two segments of the right lobe you have the right hepatic and middle hepatic what happens is it is present in between the right and 
the left lobe and mainly they drain into the IVC and the floor of the inferior vena cava. Groove or IVC they pierce and drain as two groups, upper group and the lower group through which they drain. Okay. So, the middle group, right group and the left group mainly drain as upper and the lower groups. Apart from we also have some short hepatic veins. That is the venous drainage of the liver. So, lymphatics mainly hepatic nodes, they mainly drain into celiac and para aortic nodes. Hepatic nodes drain ultimately into celiac and para aortic nodes. Then finally, what happens is through the cisterna kyrie thoracic duct, they open into the venae cable system, junction of the subclavian vein and internal jugular vein from the cisterna kyrie. The hepatic nodes through celiac nodes and the parietic nodes. So, mainly the lymphatics which follow this one, the veins through the cisterna kyrie, thoracic duct, they go. Some directly what happens is they pierce via the diaphragm and they might drain to the mediastinal nodes, nerve supply. So, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is from the celiac plexus, parasympathetic is from the anterior vagal trunk anterior vagal trunk. What actually keeps the liver in its position? 1.5 kilograms weighing gland is mainly kept in its position by the inferior vena cava. So, the primary support is the inferior vena cava, the hepatic veins opening into the IVC. So, that holds the liver in its position. It is a very much a mobile organ, moves with respiration because the diaphragm displaces its downwards. Intra-abdominal pressure which is created by the surrounding viscera and the least important comes the peritoneal ligaments. That is your uh, ligamentum teres, falciform ligament, uh, lesser omentum or ligamentum venosum, all these are actually least important. Okay. So, the secondary support as I told you, the surrounding your kidney, colon, angle, duodenum, pancreas, all those things exert an accessory support. And finally, liver to the anterior abdominal wall and diaphragm by the falciform ligament. So, mainly it is the hepatic veins followed by the intra-abdominal pressure. <coughs> so, those keeps the liver in position. Next, coming to the clinical correlations, finally. So, this is actually how the cirrhosis of the liver will take place. Regenerative nodules, you mainly come across in the cirrhosis of the liver. So, mainly the hepatocytes gets necrosed. Mainly, most common function is alcohol or due to infections. Hepatitis might be caused due to viral infections, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C and all those things are there. So, there are vaccines available mainly for hepatitis B because once hepatitis B, if it is infected, it is very difficult to cure. So, these dead cells, what happens is they will be replaced or fibrosed by this connective tissue, perilobular connective tissue. And resultant fibrosis is called as cirrhosis of the liver. So, when there is fibrosis, then naturally all the hepatic sinusoids, they will get blocked. So, the portal vein blood is not effectively drained by the liver and it is not detoxified by the portal blood is not detoxified by the liver and it is not actually conveyed to the systemic veins that is to the inferior vena cava. The most common condition is jaundice. Okay. So, what happens is your bilirubin level increases in the blood. So, mainly the bilirubin is in the form of free and conjugated bilirubin. So, the free bilirubin levels rise in the blood. So, following scarring you get regenerative nodules in the cirrhosis. Not only that portal pressure increases, portal cable anastomosis they are all it might increase and it might lead to various other 
manifestations like hematemesis or vomiting of blood so cortocable shunt can be performed to bypass the liver now this is a healthy liver before going cirrhosis it might represent a fatty liver deposition of fat so again this fatty liver can be graded into stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 fatty liver now fatty liver not only occurs due to the alcohol it is due to alcohol it is called as alcoholic fatty liver there is also called as non alcoholic fatty liver so non alcoholic fatty liver mainly occurs mainly due to our diet or any other improper usage of uh, drugs hepatitis or injury to the liver can take place due to any drugs which are allergic or which is not under medical supervision if it is taken on your own with improper dosage administration or for prolonged use so cortocable shunt is actually created there are different types of cortocable shunt what is C? it is this part of the portal vein is cut and directly anastomosed to the ivc or here one branch of the vein see this splenic vein is actually anastomosed to the renal vein so there are different ways of cortocable shunting cortocable shunt is bypassing the liver the portal vein is directly anastomosed to the systemic vein so needle biopsy right lateral surface i have already discussed about it mainly in the ninth below the ninth intercostal space it is done so that you don't puncture the lung or the pleura that by creating a pneumothorax after full expiration then what happens needle biopsy can be done to the right lateral surface on the mid axillary line okay so to the right anterior intraperitoneal space to enter the liver so below the pleura <coughs> so above that if you go naturally you are going to puncture the pleura and create a pneumothorax so lobectomy or segmental ectomy resection of the liver is mainly possible because these hepatic segments are mainly supplied by the branches of the hepatic arteries and the what happens is branches of hepatic and left portal veins they do not communicate so naturally that segment of the liver can be removed segment ectomy or lobectomy and even if the 3/5 of the liver is removed the liver can grow by itself through mitosis it has got a very large regenerating power but only thing unorganized growth can lead to again cirrhosis of the liver same way carcinoma of the liver so in carcinoma of the liver sometimes hepatic lobectomy and segmentectomy is performed to remove the affected part of the liver so liver rupture mainly what happens it might be due to any stab wound direct blow or trauma and there will be very much of hemorrhage because the portal veins when they are ruptured naturally what happens is they cannot retract and they bleed profusely okay so naturally what happens is devitalized tissue has to be removed by a segmentectomy hepatomegaly so enlargement liver enlargement mainly in hepatitis you come across or in bacterial and viral infections as hepatitis as i told you or in congestive heart failure you get hepatomegaly the liver can be palpated below the right costal margin okay so it can be palpated below the right costal margin when it is enlarged in case of the hepatomegaly so portal hypertension as i told you if there is fibrosis followed by cirrhosis of the liver then naturally there will be portal pressure will increase and the signs of portal hypertension you can see manifesting of some clinical signs and ascites so collection of fluid inside the abdomen so signs of portal systemic anastomosis mainly at the lower end of esophagus at the bare area of liver 
at the rectum and at the anterior abdominal wall. All these places it can manifest as hemorrhoids, acute medusae and esophageal varices is hematemesis or vomiting of blood. So this is ascites because of the portal hypertension, collection of fluid inside the peritoneal cavity. So that is all about the liver and thank you very much for your patient listening.